And I've never been the same since. Boy, I'm telling you, I was a mess when he found me, and I'm not sure why he wanted to find me. If I'd have been him, I'd have probably given up on me before I even got started. But he found me and cleaned me up and changed me. I'm not what I ought to be yet, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. And he's still working on me, and he's still working on you too if you're saved today. And, uh, and if you're not saved, he's probably working in your heart telling you you're here for a reason today or you're listening on the Internet today for a reason. And that reason is if you're not saved, that reason is that you can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you can be saved. And if you are saved today, he's got a reason for you being here too. And I think uh, besides what we've already done today, the good lessons, the good, uh, the good singing, congregationals and special, we've got uh, some other things I think that there's a reason to be here, and that is the Word of God and the possibility that God might speak to us in His church. Would you tell yourself that just in your own heart right now? Say, God may speak to me this morning, so I think I'll listen and see if God will speak to me. I've got bees. Most of you know that I'm a beekeeper. I, I kind of put them to bed in the fall. They hibernate kind of like hibernating. They cluster up like a cluster of grapes inside their hive, and they, they keep each other warm, and they generate their own heat. And, uh, and they can generally survive that way if their cluster is big enough. That queen is usually on the inside of that cluster, and the workers rotate in and out of the outside edge of that cluster. So the outside ones, they're going to be cold trying to keep the others warm. And so they rotate to the inside every once in a while so they can get warm up, warmed up too. And, uh, and if a beehive has a good number of bees in it, they'll survive this really cold weather. So I put mine to bed, so to speak, back in the fall. And they, I noticed they had plenty of honey. Sometimes a hive will starve to death because they don't have enough honey. Uh, but this time I made sure I left plenty of honey on them. And uh, so yesterday was the first day that's even been close to being warm. Did anybody think it was springtime yesterday? <laughs> Compared to what we've had, it was like springtime. And so it was the only day I felt comfortable about opening up the hives and looking inside. I've got four hives there at my house, and I've got some other bee yards that are in different places around the county and I hadn't checked those yet. I didn't have time to go see about them, but after I got back from visitation yesterday, I got in the backyard about 2 or 3 o'clock, and, and uh, it was still warm enough. Even though it had clouded up a little, I, I opened up those four hives and looked in them, and three out of those four hives had frozen to death. I've got one hive left in my yard. Now, I've got some other hives in other places, I hope. I haven't checked them yet. I hope they didn't all freeze to death. But I'm looking on the internet and seeing that many other beekeepers have suffered similar losses, about 75% due to the extreme cold weather. Bees can take one night or so of, uh, of really cold weather, but when it stays in the single digits or around zero for a week or so straight, that's rough on bees. And so in the hives that I looked in, those clusters, they, they did have a little cluster, but it was a small cluster the ones that froze to death. The one that survived had a larger cluster, and they were doing fine yesterday. They were out flying around gathering, gather, not nectar, but uh, pollen, and, and I was feeding them a little bit. And so the good strong hives survived. The weak hives that had a small cluster didn't have very many bees to supply heat for each other. They starved. So if you don't come to church regular and keep us a good crowd here, you're going to freeze to death. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> Well, you might not freeze to death physically, but you'll get cold spiritually. And we need each other to stay in the cluster. Right? Sermon's over. We'll have the invitation now. <laughs> All right. We'll be in, uh, we're going to be, for our Bible message, we'll be in Joshua chapter number 6. I told you that story about the bees not to entertain you but to illustrate to you a truth that we can do things together. Are you listening to me? I know you're looking for your book of Joshua, but try to look for the book of Joshua and listen at the same time if you can. Uh, there, are, there is a great truth in the fact that because Joshua 
took a group of people in this passage of Scripture and they accomplished something big because they followed God together. They followed God together. They stuck together. And something big happened. And if you and I stick together in the things of God, we might have a better chance of seeing big things happen. If you keep your family, listen, if you keep your family stuck together following God, it's a lot easier to see big things happen. And so we're going to read here in Joshua chapter number 6, uh, and we'll begin in verse 1 in just a second. Let me, let me bring you up to speed. Aaron taught in Sunday school about the children of Israel being in, in Egypt and coming out and uh, Moses going down to lead them out. Well, where we're at here in Joshua, listen to this. Uh, this, is, this is a long time later after Moses had led the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years. They crossed the Jordan River through a miraculous parting of the waters into the promised land. The first city that they had to do battle with was Jericho. And Jericho was an established city, but God gave them a great victory. I said God gave them a great victory. And uh, their, big, their big deal was they stuck together and followed God's directions and everything turned out good. Let's begin in, in verse number 6 and we'll see how this capturing of Jericho, I want to give the message a title today and uh, we're going to call it uh, Conquering Your own city. And now you could put in the place of that word city your circumstances. Conquering your circumstances or conquering your city. Together as a church we ought to be set out to conquer Circe for the cause of Christ. And in our families and in our circumstances we ought to set out to conquer the circumstances that look so formidable around us by following God. God can give you the victory. Verse number 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went in, none went out, and came in, none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor, and ye shall compass the city. The word compass there means that they're going to go out and circle around the city. And ye shall compass the city... Ye all ye men of war, and go round about. See the words round about? That's what compass means. Round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do, how many days? Six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark. That's the ark of the covenant. Where that ark of the covenant was their symbolic reference to the presence of God dwelling in that ark or over that ark. Seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all of the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Now skip over uh, down there to about verse number 12. <clears throat> and Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took, the, took up the ark of the Lord, and uh, <clears throat> the seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the, <clears throat> of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the re rearward, now you see the word rearward? That rear word means, we would spell it in, in maybe contemporary English, R-E-A-R-W-A-R-D. The rear word. In other words, the rear word, that's not re-reward. I've heard several preachers who were otherwise uh, pretty good, except they didn't know what that word meant. Rear word means the people behind, those coming up from the rear, rear word. Like eastward, these are rear word, behind, okay? And so... In verse number 12, And Joshua rose up early in the morning, the priests took up the ark, and the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, and the rearward came after the ark. 
of the Lord and the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and they returned into the camp and so they did six days. Are you with me so far? Here's the people of God. They've been instructed by God himself walk around this city, march around the city one time every day. And the next day you walk around it again one time. And you do this for six days. And then on the seventh day, we're going to go around that city seven times. And we're going to have a shouting spell when we go around it the seventh time. Amen. And so, verse number 15, it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass... At the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout. Let's do that together. We're going to say, hey, on the count of three. Let's go and shout together. Everybody ready to shout? So you've got a part in this too. You're going to help me preach. Ready? On the count of three, we're going to holler, hey. One, two, three. Hey. That's what they did, only they shouted louder than that. Y'all are a little wimpy. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. We're going to try hey on the count of three. One, two, three. Hey, that's better. Yeah, I think y'all about ready to conquer Jericho now. All right. And uh, for the Lord, how did they shout? For the Lord hath given you the city. Wait a minute. The walls haven't fallen yet. What are they shouting about? They're shouting because God said, I've already decided you're getting the city. All you got to do is shout and I'm going to make the walls fall. So why did they shout? Because they knew God would keep his word and make those walls fall. Bang. And we ought to shout before our prayers are answered. And we ought to shout before God does something great that he's promised to do for us. We ought to shout about going to heaven because he said it's good is done. Well, verse number 17, And the city uh, shall be accursed, and all that are therein to the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live. Now stop right there just for a moment and look up here. Rahab the harlot, you may have read there before where you discovered that she protected the spies from Israel as they explored the land. And so she put them up on the rooftop and covered them with flax stalks and kept them from being killed by her own people. And so since she protected those people, the spies from Israel, they said, we're going to save you and your family alive during the battle. You get to live. That's pretty good, isn't it? All right, and so that's why they promised that she would live. Rahab the harlot harlot shall live. Aren't you glad that just anybody can have God's promise? You're just an old worthless harlot, and uh, God gave her a reprieve from her death sentence. And all of us are worthless before God. None of us have... You know, in our original state before we got saved, none of us had any better standing before God than that harlot did. We were all worthless. Well, it says, Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house. That shows how important it is for a woman, even of this stature, to look out for her household. We'll be looking out for our household, right? Make sure that they live. Because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city every man straight before him and they took that city just like God said. Can we pray together? Father, I pray that you would bless us. Lord, help us to understand this passage of Scripture that how it worked for Israel and what it might mean for us today. I pray that you'd bless us in a wonderful way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're giving the, the message a title. What, what title did we give it? I forgot. Remind me. Huh? Conquering your city. Yeah, conquering your city. 
You know, you've got a city to conquer. You've got circumstances to conquer. And that's what we're really talking about today. We want to see the historical aspect of it. But we don't care as much, I guess, about what happened to Israel back in that day as what might happen to us in our day, right? We're concerned about us and now. I mean, that's all in the sweet by and by. We're looking about the nasty now and now. And so we want to see what to do to win our city, to conquer our city, to have victory in our family, have victory in our church. And so I want you to see several things about this as we look through it. And uh, this first conquest was of that city Jericho as the children of Israel. They've been marching. They've been marching through the wilderness. Remember, some of them had no faith at Kadesh Barnea. They had zero faith. They wouldn't go in when God said go in. And so because of that, he said your carcasses are going to fall in the wilderness and the younger generation will go into the promised land. And so sure enough, for 40 years they wandered and a whole lot of people died. And after a whole bunch of people died and Moses himself died, then Joshua was appointed the new leader and he went across on dry land as God opened up the Jordan River. And you say, you believe that, preacher? You really believe that God stopped a big raging river and let them walk across on dry ground? Well, that's what he says. <laughs> if it says, I believe it. Somebody said, do you really believe uh, a whale swallowed Jonah in the Bible? And uh, this one old preacher said, I'd believe it if it said, uh, said that Jonah swallowed the whale. <laughs> if the Bible says it, I just believe it. Amen. And so I believe that Joshua led that bunch of Israelites across the, the Jordan River on dry ground. They went over there and set up camp. And God said, now here's how you're going to win your first battle. You ain't going to shoot at nobody with your bows and arrows. You ain't going to throw any spears. You're going to walk around the city every day for six days and just blow the horns and just walk around. The rest of you be quiet while the priests blow their horns. And on the seventh day, you're going to walk around it seven times. And then on the seventh time, you're going to shout with a loud shout. And when you do that, the walls are going to fall down. God said, that's the way it's going to be. Joshua said, say what? <laughs> Joshua, a, he's a military general. I mean, he's, he's out to fight, man. He wants to yank out his six-gun and blow some heads off. And, uh, well, wait, that, that didn't happen until the wild, wild west. Did it? And so they're ready to do business with these people with uh, regular means of battle. And God said, I'm going to show you a different way that we're going to do it, and I'm going to get the glory, not you. And so that's the way they went about it. And God gave them some interesting things to do. I want you to see, number one, the, ma the message for the conquest. God told Joshua, are you with me now? Don't go to sleep on me. i got to keep you awake because <laughs> I want you to get something out of this. This is how you get some nuggets of gold for your tra spiritual treasury. I want you to see, first of all, the message, the message that God gave Joshua and told him how to conquer Jericho. You know, God's got the best way of doing things. You knew that, didn't you? God's got the best way. We begin to figure out in our own little pea brain how we're going to do this or do that. And we don't have it figured out as often as we think we do. God's got the best way. And we can usually find out God's way right here. And uh, the Bible has the right way. And God has the best way. And if our way conflicts with God's way, guess who ought to come out on top? His way ought to be the way we end up doing it. Well, God had a way for these Israelites to win the victory in Old Testament Jericho. And uh, God's got a way for Liberty Baptist Church to win New Testament Circe. Huh? Now, we're not talking about knocking down walls and sticking people with a sword. We're talking about winning people's souls to Jesus Christ. We're talking about winning some battles in soul winning. We're talking about winning some battles in morality. We're talking about winning some battles in people's lives individually and in their homes and in their church. We're talking about having victory. And God has the best way, and we don't need a new way. Hey, I see churches all over the country and all around the world, man. They're, they're trying to devise up new ways and a lot of times those new ways go against the grain of the scriptures. And uh, if it's not 
able to fit in here. I don't want to do it, right? And so we need to do it God's way. See, first of all, when we're talking about this message, see what's in the message. Number one, there were promises there, promises. And in these promises, these Israelites trusted, and you and I need to trust. For instance, well, okay, let's say, give us a real example. Sometimes we need a real example to see how, how God's promises will come to pass. Because, and I'm going to give you a tough one because I don't want you to just see some little piddly something that anybody could fake. I want you to see, I want to hit you where it hurts. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> Might as well just hit you right where it hurts. See if, see if you believe God or not. God says, try me now, saith the Lord, and if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there is not room enough to receive when he's talking about tithing and giving and offerings and so forth. And there's people who say, well, you Baptist preachers, all you want to do is preach on money. (laughs) Well, that's because usually that tells where your heart is. For where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. And if somebody can't trust God's promise, we're talking about His promise. You with me? Say amen so I know you're not ashamed. (laughs) If we can't trust God's promise about tithing, how come we can trust His promise in John 3, 16 that we can call upon the name of the Lord on the name of Jesus Christ and be saved? How come we believe that? How come we can trust that promise but not that God will take care of our piddly little old expenses? Well, I'm on a fixed income. Isn't everybody? <laughs> I mean, you pretty well know what you're going to make, right? From there downward. Did anybody notice that there seems like these days there's more month than there is money? <laughs> That's the trying of your faith when you say, well, I would tithe, but man, it just seems like there's not enough money to pay everything. And buy my fishing boat and my golf clubs and that car I want and all of that stuff too. <laughs> huh? Say, oh me. <laughs> and so, I'm saying, when it comes to God's promises, do we really believe them and are we willing to try them out? These Israelites are called to conquer a city called Jericho with high walls and, and why are they going to trust God? Because who else will you trust? Do you trust your bank more than you trust God? Do you trust your doctor more than you trust God? Do you trust some lawyer more than you trust God? Do you trust some prescription more than you trust God? Do you trust, I'm not saying your prescriptions are wrong. I'm saying if if you don't talk to God first, you may be getting the horse before the cart. And I'm just saying everything that we do in life, we ought to be able to rely upon God's promises. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? We say we believe that, and yet when it comes to faith promise time to support missionaries, to send missionaries around the world, some people get heart attack. Say, man, I, I can't give like that, not to missions. I mean, let those missionaries <laughs> fend for themselves. Well, most of them are, most countries where they go, they're not allowed to work in that country because that country doesn't want foreigners coming in and taking their jobs, unlike America. <laughs> <coughs> And so missionaries who go across the waters to serve in another country depend on people like you and me. And see, when they're over there and they, their family doesn't eat, if we don't send something to them, you go for a few days without food and you'll understand what they're going through. And so faith promise missions becomes very important. When we believe God's promise, he says that if we'll give, he'll supply our needs. When we tithe, when we give faith promise missions, and I'm not talking about stealing the tithe in order to give it to missions. I'm talking about tithing, giving to missions, and giving offerings too. All three? <laughs> yeah. We got people in here who give huge amounts to missions. We got people who give 50, 75, maybe $100 a month. Some give that much a week. You say, well, I ain't giving that kind of money. Are you skin flint in other areas? 
Oh, so you're meddling, preacher. Well, let me move on to another one then. So we see the promises. Do we trust God? And then we see the precepts. God gave precepts. Precept is different than a principle. A principle is, is a general truth that we can build other attitudes and actions upon that truth. A precept is a direct command. A precept is thou shalt do this. Now, God gave the precepts to these children of Israel. We're still with the children of Israel there at Jericho, right? And so he says, here's what I want you to do. March around that city one time every day, seven times on Sunday. Well, it might have been Saturday. Who knows? It just says the seventh day. And so he said, that on the seventh day, I'm going to make the walls fall down when you shout. And so he told them precisely what he wanted them to do. That's a precept. And so... When we find precepts, we ought to be willing to listen to them. There are some precepts in the Bible. Um, there's a story about a company, this is back in the Morse code days. Everybody know what Morse code is? Uh, most of us that are a little bit older at least know what Morse code is. A dot dash, dot dash, dash, dot dash. Uh, back in the telegraph days before we had uh, telephones and and uh, cell phones and internet and all that. And so they communicated by telegraph, and it had its own Morse code that you had to know the Morse code to know what letter was represented. Uh, the letter A had a, a dot or a dash or a certain number of dots and dashes, as did every letter in the alphabet, and you had to be trained in it to know. And so this company was advertising for uh, job applicants to come and apply for this job as a as a telegraph operator, and you had to know Morse code. And so this young, one young man, <clears throat> he, was, he was just about 20 years old. He showed up that morning when the newspaper had advertised. He showed up, walked into the office, and, uh, and he heard this rat-a-tat-tat, 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 and there was about 15 other guys sitting in there waiting for their turn to get to the interview. Well, immediately this guy walked right through the boss's office door and walked right in and was in there five minutes and came back out with the boss. And the boss said, the rest of you can be dismissed. This young man's got the job already. And, man, some of them were mad. They said, well, wait, we've been here for two hours waiting to get to talk to you. How come he gets a job after he's been here five minutes? And the boss pointed up on the wall. He said, we use Morse code here. He said, that message has been tapping out all the time while the rest of you were sitting here two hours, that Morse code message was saying, if you understand this message, come in the office. The job is yours. <laughs> Sometimes God's tapping out his message and it may be striking our eardrums, but it ain't touching our heart. Right. We need to listen to the word of God. God's got a word for us. Can you just picture these people, these Israelites? They're all out there. And, <clears throat> and God says, what I want you to do specifically is walk around this city as a group. March around this city every day for seven days and seven times the seventh day. And then shout. What, do you, can you just picture maybe some of them going over there and just sitting down under the shade tree and saying, nah, that doesn't sound interesting to me. <laughs> I don't think I'll do this. And nobody gets up and does anything. Do you think the results would have turned out the same? People who listen to God and follow God's instructions tend to be blessed. And this people work together as a group. Man, you talk about Liberty Baptist Church glorified. Those people were working together as a group. And they got the job done. You see, God did it. But he wanted them to be involved in the effort. It was God who did the victory, but he wanted them to be busy. It's kind of like people, you know, when people, uh, the Bible says if, if any would not work, neither should he eat. You know, some people would say, well, I've got faith that God's going to take care of me. I'm not going to apply for a job. I'm not going to go to work, but I believe God will take care of me. You may be in for a rude awakening. <laughs> uh, I, this is not in the Bible, but it is, I think it is true where, People have said, uh, you know, if, uh, if, you want to, if you want to eat, go to work, or God helps those who help themselves. If we've got faith in God and we get busy doing what God's instructed us to do, 
it has a way of working itself out. Well, God gives these promises to His children. He gives these precepts to His children. And so we've seen the message of God. Number two, the marching for the conquest. Not just the message for the conquest, but the marching. And uh, what can we see here in the marching? Well, what did that do for him anyway? Why, did God, why didn't God just slap those walls and knock them down right from the beginning? Why did God make them go to the trouble of marching around there seven days in a row with seven times on the seventh day? Why make them do that? Why didn't God just knock those walls over at the beginning? Because, number one, it exercised Israel's faith. God has a way of making us do things according to His plan and seeing Him work in the way that He said He would do to exercise our faith. It's not for God, it's for us. And sometimes God wants you to do something in a certain way. Why does that preacher want us to come to church three times a week anyway? I wonder if God maybe has a purpose in having us to do some things that may seem repetitive. Repetitive. And it's not so God figures out what to do next or to kill time. It may be so that we figure things out that God can do a lot of things with us. It exercised Israel's faith. Number two, it excited Jericho's fear. I remember these people are shut up. It says there in verse uh, 1 or 2, it says that, that Jericho was shut up. Well, man, they'd already heard what God had been doing with those Israelites. They, they, they shut up. They, didn't want, they saw Israel out there on the plains marching in, and they said, well, we've heard about what's happened with them. We've heard about God giving uh, a victory to them over some of those people out yonder in the outlying areas and giving them some victories already. We've heard about God opening up that Jordan River and letting them cross on dry land. We've heard some of those things, and we want nothing to do with them. We're shutting the doors and keeping them out. And so the fact that these Israelites marched around the, the city seven days straight produced some fear in the enemy. When you and I are obedient to God, it produces some fear in the devil's heart. He doesn't like to see us doing things. Well, we go on soul winning visitation and I don't ever see anybody get saved. If you go long enough, you probably will. You probably will. <laughs> and even if you don't, your command, remember we talked about the precepts, your command is not actually to save somebody. Your command is to witness to them. And it's God's job to do the saving. So if, if I witness to people and nobody gets saved, that's not my problem. That's up to God. My job is just to witness to them. Kind of like the man <clears throat> was, uh, had this big rock out in his yard and he wanted to move that rock. And, and he prayed and said, Lord, I'd, I'd like for that rock to be moved. And God said, well, I'll tell you what, go out there and push on that rock for 30 minutes every day. And the man did that. He pushed on that rock. He'd grunt. Man, that rock weighed 10 tons. He couldn't move it an inch. After about a week, the man said, Lord, I'm getting tired of praying about this. I've been pushing on that rock every day and hadn't moved an inch. And God said, well, I didn't tell you that you could move it. I can move it, but you can't. And then God moved it. And that's what he did here. Fear. He produced fear in the hearts of the enemies and it exalted God's force. When the people saw those walls fall down and when they shouted, <laughs> you know what they see? They saw that God was powerful more than ever before. How many of you know we serve a powerful God? And, uh, and God wanted those Israelites to know that God has power. And so when he knocked those walls down on the seventh day, it showed his powerful force. You know, when you, when you follow the Lord's plan... And God does something big in your life. Doesn't that increase your faith in His power to do that? I, we'll give you number three, the miracle in the conquest. The miracle, the results of their marching and uh, according to God's instructions was very miraculous. I mean, those walls fell down, right? That was a miracle. And God can do that. No one could deny that God did that because these people are out there marching around and all they've got is that Ark of the Covenant and a few old goat horns are blowing on. 
It's obvious they didn't make the walls fall down. God did that. And so they saw a miracle. And what you and I need to see every once in a while is some miraculous results from our prayers, some miraculous results from what we do here at church, some miraculous results in people's lives of changed lives, some things that happen only because God could do it. Number four, the magnitude. We've seen the message, the march, the miracle, and next, the magnitude of God's conquest. In verse number 21, well, no, not 21. Where did it say? Uh, I found my place again. Oh, and yeah, it is verse 21. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass, and with the edge of the sword. This whole city ended up, the walls fell down. The city was destroyed just like God said it would be. These were the enemies of the Israelites. And God did this and it was complete. It says they utterly destroyed that place. Get that word utterly? (laughs) When God does something, he does it big time. God is not half-hearted in what he does. God doesn't just kind of piddle with things. God, he, The Bible says about Jesus, He doeth all things well. He doeth all things well. Aren't you glad that God just doesn't, doesn't save you halfway? <laughs> aren't you glad that when, when He resurrects you from the grave as a Christian, aren't you glad that your whole body will be resurrected instead of going up in the air and looking back and saying, uh-oh, there's a leg got left behind. <laughs> What he does is complete. What God does, he does well. He finishes the job. He's not half-hearted. He's consistent and complete. He's do- he doesn't piddle like maybe we do. He doesn't do his jobs halfway like we might. He does it well, and he does it complete. Well, it was the magnitude that was worth looking at. Is a magnitude that just went far beyond what the mind could master. And then the last one is the mercy in the conquest. It says that Rahab and her, and her family were spared. Rahab had put these spies up on the roof and hid them uh, in the earlier days and they promised that they had saved her alive. How did they save her? Physically, right? Some people, now this is where I'm a dispensationalist. I part ways uh, on passages like this with my hyper-dispensationalist brothers who say, well, see there, there's works, salvation in the Old Testament. It says nothing about saving her soul there. It says that she was saved. How were those people that were destroyed? How were they destroyed? They were destroyed physically. They were killed. And we're talking about physical salvation, not the soul salvation. Was Rahab, Rahab saved in her soul? Yeah, but she was saved by believing the spies' report and she believed what God had been doing. She believed in the God that could save and her soul was saved by believing. Believe and thou shalt be saved. All the way through the Bible, it's by believing, by trusting in Jesus Christ. No works involved in salvation. So why did they save her? She got saved physically. Her life was saved because of her works. Her deeds saved her life, but they didn't save her soul. She was saved in her soul like all the other Old Testament people were who got saved. They got saved by believing. And when people get saved physically in the Old Testament, that's not equated to the salvation of the soul. So where's the mercy here? The mercy is that that because Rahab helped the people of God, she was spared that day when everybody else in her city was killed. Her and her household were saved alive. And in conclusion, I'll just say this. If anybody in this room or anybody on the Internet who's listening right now or by recorded message, if you have trusted in your good deeds to get you to heaven... I'm, I've got to be honest with you and tell you, you're trusting the wrong thing and you have been deceived. And nobody gets to heaven by doing, you get to heaven by believing. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never trusted Him, that's what salvation is. Salvation is not walking down an aisle and kneeling at an altar. Salvation is not getting in the water. 
Those are good things to do and they are deeds that are worthy of note after you're saved. But none of those things save you spiritually. Your soul is saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him only. And if you've never believed, you joined a church and thought that was salvation, that's not salvation. You're saved by believing. Would you trust Him today and what He did on the cross of Calvary for you? And you can go to heaven. And uh, maybe I'm talking to Christians now too who have uh, never got involved in being in the cluster. You know, everybody who's saved and baptized ought to be a member of a local Bible-preaching church because that makes our cluster warmer and that makes us able to serve God in a more efficient manner. And uh, church ought not to just be a place where people drop in once in a while. Church ought to be something you belong to because you are saved and because you want to serve. And there's a place of service for everybody. You say, what can I do? I, I don't think I could teach a class. I don't think I could sing a special. I'm not sure I could go visit on a bus route because of my health or something like that. But there is something everybody can do. You know what? One thing you can do, you can circle your city. We're talking about the Israelites. Listen, with me. You can circle this city in prayer. You can circle your neighborhood by inviting people to church. You can invite people to Jesus Christ. You might not be able to go drive up and down the streets, but you can, you can visit with your next door neighbor. I'm not talking about just thinking about doing it. I'm talking about doing it. Remember those Israelites? They didn't just go sit down under the shade tree and say, yeah, that's a good idea, but I don't think I'll do it. <laughs> they got up and marched around. And we can cover this city. We can, we can give you a map of a whole section of the city, a neighborhood that you can go and witness to that little section of the city and claim it as your own. Say, that's, that little section, there's a, there's a six-block square section that I'm going to make my responsibility. And together we can circle this city with our witness by witnessing to people, soul winning. We can cover this city in inviting people to come to church. You know the best advertisement a church gets is when you go to your next door neighbor and say, hey, why don't you come to our church? Let me pick you up Sunday morning and come to, come to church with us Sunday. Now, I'm not talking about stealing people from other churches. We believe in getting our own people that's unchurched, right? Now, if somebody comes from another church, that's fine. But we don't go out and practice sheep stealing and just go and snatch people out of other churches if it's a gospel preaching church. Now, if it's an old cult, get them. <laughs> <laughs> But we can cover this city. We can compass this city about. And uh, together, we can keep the cluster warm and we can build the cluster up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray you'd.